Psalm 37, we're going to read the first eight verses. Psalm 37. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Be thou envious again. Be thou envious, sorry. Be thou, sorry, I'm going to reread it. <laughs> Psalm 31, ver, 37, verses 1 to 8. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and it shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in, the, in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Father, once again I ask, Lord, for help and unction to preach this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Psalm 37 is a psalm that was written by David during the latter stages of his life when he was an old man. It is a companion psalm with Psalm 73. In verse 25, he tells us, I have been young and now I'm old. He addresses a problem that has plagued the people of God since the dawn of time. That problem is, why do the wicked seem to prosper while the, right, while the righteous suffer? Why do the wicked seem to prosper while the righteous seem to suffer? This problem is also addressed in Psalm 73 and 49. It is also a prominent theme in the book of Job. Whether we will admit it or not, it is also a problem that we also struggle with from time to time. But over here, we are emphatically told not to envy, not to fret either. In fact, it is strongly condemned Neither, where it says, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. So it is strongly condemned here. This condemnation is partly, particularly rather true when that envy is directed toward the lost. So I hope that this doesn't describe anyone here. I believe it doesn't, but if it does, you need to get right. Sometimes it seems like the wicked always prosper while the godly seem to suffer, yet we always need to remember as saints of God that our earthly existence is as close to hell as we are ever going to get. Think about that. Whatever trials that may befall us here on this earth, and as bad as they are going to, basically as bad as it's going to get for us. Bad as it's going to get for us. For the wicked, this is not so. Because they will have their day of reckoning. Their days are, are their days of, or rather, their few days of pleasure here on earth are short, and they have no future beyond this life. In fact, it will only get worse once they're gone. So, conversely speaking, this world is as close to heaven as it will ever be. Think about that. So as we see this world waxing worse and worse with evil being called good and good being called evil, we are also commanded not to fret over it. The word fret, which is mentioned three times within these verses, speaks of a burning, furious anger to the point of complete vexation. Now there is a time for righteous indignation. I agree with that. There is a time for it. There's certainly a time for righteous indignation toward what is going on around us. We're seeing wickedness around us. You're allowed to be mad, but you're not allowed to be consumed with it to the point where you're going to act upon it. So we are, we're, there is a time for righteous indignation. You know, when I see posters putting up, put up, promoting drag queen storytelling hour for children, for five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, in our public libraries in Durham region where I live, then righteous indignation is an appropriate response. If you love children, it ought to be. In fact, I believe that we ought to speak up and expose this wickedness for what it is. We are living in a society where it seems that there are no holds barred anymore and that anything goes. It's lawless. But Jesus said, iniquity shall abound. That's lawlessness. There are no longer any moral restraints and there is no shame anymore. No shame in anyone. No shame whatsoever. 
And I find the, most, the more what they say woke they are, the more shameless they are. You know, the more, the, the call, I hate to use the term left and right because really it's just a reprobate mindset. That's what the left mindset is, reprobate. Although we get worked up over some pervert who is dressed like a whore being, being allowed to tell wicked perverted stories to our children, my question is, why are the parents of these children allowing it? They wouldn't be doing it if they didn't have children to tell these stories. And these children have parents. So what are the parents thinking? Where are their heads? Probably parents with green hair and purple hair and no kinds of piercings. Why are they allowing this? These events would not happen unless there was an audience for them. And it appears that there is. There is. To any parent who's exposing their children to this woke, quote unquote, I've never used that word until recently, to this woke, wicked agenda, and who is allowing their children to be indoctrinated into thinking that there are 70 different genders and made up out of thin air pronoun, pronouns to match, Jesus said that, there would be, that it would be better for you to, uh, to hang a millstone around your neck and to drown yourself in the sea. In other words, it would be better for you to commit suicide than to offend one of these little ones, one of these little children. Any teaching that keeps our children from Jesus is an abomination to God. And this is what Jesus is saying here, Matthew chapter 8, verses uh, 18, rather, verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, and I will read, but you can mark it down. And he says this, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth, in the depth of the sea. Yes. Yeah, it's Matthew chapter 18. Verse 6 is the focal uh, point, but I, I took verse 5 with it. You ought to receive these little children in Jesus' name. God loves children. They are precious to him. They are, they are his heritage. That's what the Bible says. By the way, what our children are being taught in our government schools and what they are being exposed to through our modern day pop culture is preparing them to receive the Antichrist and not Jesus Christ. Parents, beware. Christian parents particularly, beware. You will be held accountable to God for what you allow your children to be subjected to. To this day, I do not understand Christian parents who openly promote and subject their children to the evil uh, pagan abomination of Disney and of that ilk and other things of that ilk. My question is why? Why are you doing this? They're openly promoting uh, homosexuality. Right? Let's call it sodomy. Sodomy. LGBTQ. This transgender confusion nonsense. They're pushing all of this. And you're allowing your children to watch this garbage? And above all, they're pushing witchcraft. Disney's all about witchcraft. And you think it's not going to affect the hearts and minds of your children? It will. Do these parents have any discernment? Do they? No. So indeed, there is a place for righteous indignation. But we are not to allow this indignation to rule us, to govern us, to consume us. Recently, I read an article by, article by David Cloud speaking on this very issue about fretting over the evil we see around us, particularly when it comes to politics. And this is what he says. This shows very plainly the error of America's political conservative movement. You can, you, you can extend that to Canada. Fretting permeates politically conservative talk, radio, websites, and social media. These days, they are fretting about the border, Biden's cognitive decline, Kamala Harris, gun control, oil pipelines, wokeness, Russian hackers, violence in the cities, inflation or hyperinflation, and the infrastructure bill. Among many other things, they are fretting over these things. There are gen these are genuine concerns, of course. Like I said, they're genuine concerns. But fretting is not what the believer is to be doing. The questions for God's people are first, what can we do? And second, what should we do? Unsaved political conservatives fret because they have no true wisdom and don't therefore understand the fundamental spiritual realities. Even here, 
They don't understand the spiritual realities. We know our Bibles. That's not to say that we don't speak up against it. That does not to say that, you know what? We ought not to show a righteous indignation. We do, but we don't fret. We don't, we're not consumed to it, consumed by it. We're not living our lives based on that. We ought not to govern how we react. They don't understand the fundamental spiritual realities. They have no power. Example, no political majority. No political majority. There was no moral majority in the 1980s, and there is no Wilco majority today, he says. And they have no real hope since they aren't born again, and that is the issue here. And they don't believe in Bible prophecy. We know what the Bible says. I know I bring it up from time to time, but I know what the Bible says. I know. And you know what? Praise God. Instead of fretting, God's people first and foremost are to be trusting God. The promises of God are a myriad, he says. The, he changes the times and the seasons, Daniel 2.21. Yes, he does. He says this, my times are, my, he, say, yeah, he says this, my times are in his hands, according to Psalm 31 and verse 15. And ultimately, all things work together for good to those who love God, Romans 8, 28. All things. That doesn't mean that you're not going to go through some trials, but you know God's going to use them. They're going to work together for good to those who love him. By the way, if you love him, you're going to go through some stuff. You're going to go through some stuff in your life. And the more that you seek to love him by obeying him, you're going to go through. So the Satan doesn't like that. He hates it. He hates to see it. First of all, he hates to see a sinner get saved and become a saint. But he hates to see a saint uh, grow in the Lord and, and really be sold out for the Lord and surrender themselves to the Lord. He's going to do everything in his power to certainly hinder that. He's going to do everything in his power to discourage them. Sometimes that discouragement can come in the form of the death of a loved one, the death of a child, and other things. Perhaps all the work, uh, you think of William Carey, who, went, who put all that work into translating uh, the Bible into uh, Sanskrit, and all that work burned up in a fire. He had to start over. Did he get discouraged? Probably he did, but you know what? Got back up and did it over again. Never mind fretting over it, just get on with it. Second, God's people are to be, uh, to be obeying Christ's great commission, he says. After his resurrection, Christ gave the marching orders for this entire age, and it is repeated in Scripture five times by way of emphasis. It is a very big job, the great commission. It entails preaching the gospel to every soul in every nation, building sound churches, discipling God's people in all things, building the families, training up the children for Christ, discipling youth, educating preachers, and educating preachers. When God's people give their full attention to God's business, they have God's power. Indeed. We have been given the spiritual work, he says, and for that business, we have mighty spiritual power. According to 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. If we turn aside to worldly programs, we have no power, and we end up fretting. We end up fretting. Thirdly, he says, God's people are to be praying. I mentioned that in the last message, a praying people. Prayer is one of the mighty weapons. It is mentioned at least 550 times in the Bible, 174 times in the New Testament alone. Christ taught much about prayer. Paul taught something about prayer in practically every epistle. How much are we to pray? Well, the Bible says that we are to be pray praying without ceasing, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We ought to be mindful of prayer. We are specifically instructed to pray for those who are in authority. Now let us turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. We are to pray for those who are in authority. First Timothy chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I exhort thee, therefore, that first of all supplications, those are requests, prayers, that's a broader term, intercessions, it's praying on behalf of someone else, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, 
These are our civil authorities. This is our prime minister. This is our premier. This is our uh, mayor and others in, in power. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Are we praying? Are we praying? So we are to pray for Justin Trudeau. We are to pray for Joe Biden in the U.S., for our, for our U.S. brethren. Doug Ford et al. Or et al. They all may be completely given over to a reprobate mind. I believe that to a degree, although I don't know it, but I suspect it based on how they, what they say. This is not someone that that's, that's, you know, becomes indignant. Atheist becomes indignant when you bring up the word of God. These people have, are beyond natural affection. They have no affection. Their consciences are so seared. They love worshiping the devil. We must pray for them. We need to pray more, probably 10 times more in most cases. We need to pray more. We need to, more, uh, we need to pray more in private, more in the home, more in the church, more in our, prayer, in our meetings and long prayer meetings. Unhur and we ought to have unhurried prayer meetings. Now, I don't necessarily believe totally in long prayers in the public setting, as, as David Cloud says here. I think short prayers in public and long prayers. I've been around long prayers in, in public around and, you know, when there's a group of you, it can become kind of tedious. And you're, you'll be honest, your focus becomes off God and more like, hurry up and get this done. Just finish already. I'll be quite frank, just end it already. Whereas, you know, when you're alone with God, it's like, it's, 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 it's a pleasure to be taking that time. It takes work. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you feel that your prayers are, in a, are not effective. Sometimes you feel that God is not hearing you. Sometimes you just, it's a struggle to get your words out. But if your heart is right with God, He is listening. He is listening. And it's literally, it is a, it is a pleasure. Although it takes work. And it's hard work. Prayer is hard work. It may not seem, seem like it when you, when, you, when you say that it's hard work, but actually doing it, you realize it takes work. I find all spiritual work is very tiring, very exhausting. You know, I remember pastor, my previous two pastors saying when you're behind a pulpit you're exhausted after it's true if you're out there even soul winning even if you're not even street preacher, you just pat, you know what you're tired there's something that maybe it's a, maybe it's a, maybe it's a principality the the, the, uh, the 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 powers of darkness coming against you against whenever you're doing the work of the lord i believe there's an element of that indeed but it's very tiring work but god will give you the grace to do it if you desire to do it Fourthly, he says, God's people are to be meditating in God's word day and night. And that gives them an entirely different worldview than the unsaved. Even than the most conservative and religious unsaved. The Bible says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. We, can't, we shouldn't be listening to these people. I know they may have some good things to say, but they can lead you off track. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Amen. So when all is said and done, Christians really ought to not be overly consumed with the evil world around us. We ought not to allow ourselves to get overly worked up to the point of vexation over the wicked, lawless men who rule this dark world. I've been kind of guilty at that, of that at times. After all, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 13, it says this, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You can apply this to apostate religious leaders like Joel Osteen, Billy Graham, and uh, Creflo Dollar, Joyce Meyer, et all, et all. But you could also apply this to, our, to the great merchants of the world like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and others. And our politicians, these are only going to get worse and worse. Things are only going to get worse and worse as a whole and not better. We need to prepare ourselves for this. The Bible says it would. Now, there are exceptions like the wonderful news of the overturning of Roe versus Wade by the U.S. Supreme Court this past Friday. That is great news indeed, as states can now ban abortion if they so choose. 
They can ban the murder of unborn babies if they choose. But at the same time, we need to be leery. We need to be leery. This is good news. And the reason why I say that we need to be leery is because we have to look at the spiritual climate of that nation, of the West in general. And I say this because of the overall moral decline of America and the West in general. It is in such a debased state that this decision may bring to light, God may be using it to bring to light the spiritual, uh, the dark spiritual roots of this woke, woke mindset that has permeated the, uh, the whoop and wharf of our society. Absolutely. The people who support the killing of, um, of our unborn babies through abortion, calling it a woman's right to do what she wants with her own body, body will have no problem killing you and I. Think about that. These are murderous people. This reprobate mindset is an unmerciful and murderous mindset. You take away their supposed right to kill an unborn child, and you will see the true darkness come to light. So we must rejoice over this decision, but we must also be leery here too. Watch over, watch our backs. Now the conspiratorial side of me says that this may be another divide and conquer technique that is being used, but regardless, that is neither here nor there. Anyhow, we are not fretting over these things. That is that we ought not to allow the evil and the evildoers of this world to take away the peace of God in our lives. See, when you are saved, you have peace with God at that moment when you come to Christ. But you know what? Your daily life may not, have, may not uh, uh, exhibit or have the peace of God in your life. Do you have that peace of God? Are you worried all the time? Are you concerned about how you're going to pay bills and things like that? These, these are genuine concerns of Christians. That's going to take away your peace of God. Are you concerned about coronavirus or whatever else? Right? I know that they, that's over, but you know what? I'm hearing more uh, reports of different outbreaks of this and that. I can't even keep track. But you know what Jesus said? You're going to see increase of pestilences. You're going to see increase of earthquakes. And earthquakes are, are worse and worse in places that never had earthquakes before or never reported them. The Bible's true. So we're not, allowed to, we're not to allow these things to distract us to the point where our eyes are off Jesus. And where our eyes are firmly on, and where our eyes rather are firmly on what is happening in this world. This will take away our peace. They will take away our peace of God. So since we are told not to worry when we see the wicked prosper, how are we supposed to deal with this problem? Well, in verses three to eight, uh, David offers an alternative to, to an alternative rather to worry. And there are some simple steps offered here that if followed, these will enable us to find peace even during the most trying times of our lives. And these steps lead to the way of peace in our lives. First of all, we need to control our walk, verse 3. We need to control our walk. It says this, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. The emphasis of this verse is for the believer to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. When this is accomplished, the result will be the Lord's favor upon your life. When we examine ourselves, we can, can we truly say that we are living lives that are pleasing to the Lord? Can we? This is something that we ought to be thinking about. Now, I'd first like to look at the command given here in this verse, which is, a, which is twofold in nature. First of all, we are to trust God. We need to learn to trust God. Even for making the rent in this place, even for uh, our daily, even for food on the table, even for our paycheck, even when things are tight, we need to trust God. And this requires faith. We need to walk by faith and not by sight. If we can trust God with the salvation of our souls, with our eternal security, then we can definitely trust Him to meet our physical needs. In fact, Jesus said, don't worry about this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and I will give you these things. I will give you what you need. You're not going to go hungry. You may starve for a bit, but you're going to be fed. Trust me. I may bring you, I may bring you to that brink, but you're going to get fed. You will be clothed. Seek me, seek me. He will still meet our needs despite the hyperinflation that is going on. 
with rising gas prices, the looming food shortages that are on the horizon and, horizon, and they are on the horizon, and the complete disintegration of the society that is around us, it is falling apart quickly. It's falling apart. See, when you take God out of the equation, the society crumbles, and that's what we're seeing. But he has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. So let us be reminded that God is still in control. He is still on his throne. When the world around us seems to be completely upside down, remember that he is in control. Now, to be honest and quite frank, I find it fascinating to actually be living in that generation that will see the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. I find it fascinating to be witnessing all the signs that Jesus prophesies of, that Jesus prophesied of happening right right to a T before our eyes. I'm fascinated by it. This is all fascinating to me. It seems like we are hearing of a new outbreak of some disease every day now. Monkeypox, meningococcal uh, meningitis are in Florida. 24 people died, but we're hearing of something new every day. In London, there's an outbreak of something else. I can't even keep track. There's outbreak after outbreak. Even if it's man-made or man-generated, God says it will happen. It will happen. In fact, it is getting out of hand. But Jesus prophesied of this. He prophesied of earthquakes of greater magnitude. And these are being reported all over the world with greater frequency than ever before. We are hearing of wars and rumors of wars continually. You have that with Russia and the Ukraine. We're speaking of Israel, Iran. You're always hearing a rumor of going to war. Who's going to make the first move? We are seeing the love of many waxing cold in our day. People with unnatural affection. Look at the reaction to this uh, Roe versus Wade. If you're okay with killing babies because you've been indoctrinated or brainwashed to think that that child is just a, a glob of cells, that it's not really a human until it's born, you are wicked. You have an unnatural affection. You've been brainwashed. Satan has really gotten to the very heart of your soul with the life the devil has. So we're seeing the love of many waxing colder and colder. And all of this is happening at a lightning pace right before our very eyes. Yet, this should not cause us to fret. No. It should not cause us to worry because Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back soon. Amen. Now speaking of the prophetic day in which we live, Daniel said that knowledge shall increase in the last days, and indeed it has. Now yesterday I read an article on the endtimesheadlines.org titled Elon Musk's iRobot with unique human personality set to be ready in three months. According to Musk, this is, not, this is an iRobot which can develop a unique human personality. He plans to unveil a prototype of the humanoid called Optimus during Tesla's AI Day event on September the 30th. The 125 pound bot is 5 foot 8 inches and will be capable of deadlifting 150 pounds while carrying 45 pounds itself. Optimus' uh, face features a screen display of information and will be fitted with autopilot software reports ladbible.com. <laughs> Mas Musk says it will include eight cameras to feed into the neural network, which is said to match the functions of the human brain. Now, remember what we watched in, on, uh, on Wednesday there, where Obama had, had launched, the, uh, long, in partnership with DARPA, the Brain Initiative to map out the human brain? They've done this already. They've done this. Because Satan really wants to get into your mind. That's the goal of it. He doesn't know what you're thinking unless you utter it, but he doesn't know what you're thinking. So he wants to get right into the mind. That's his way of counterfeiting uh, uh, the omniscience of God. The clever machine will use cameras to analyze environments by identifying objects, images, and roots. This kind of AI-driven technology will eventually lead to the complete dystopian surveillance state prophesied of in Revelation chapter 13. But nevertheless, we must not fret. We must not fear. Nor we must worry. Must, nor are we to worry. God is still in control. He is still in control. We must remember that things are never as they appear to be, or appear to our human vision. 
even when things look like they're going totally wrong in our lives, God is still working out His eternal purposes in us. Therefore, we must learn to trust the Lord in all aspects of our life. Now let's turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. So Romans 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 28. And, and the Bible says this, I'll give you some time. You there, Nathaniel? All right. And we know that all things work together for good to, lo to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. And now fast forward to verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? All of these things the Apostle Paul experienced. Verse 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So if you're going through persecution, which we could, we could. If we are going through famine, which we could, we are counted for, uh, in, the, in all these things, the Bible says, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is comforting. That is comforting. Don't fret. There are times when God's way is difficult to figure out. During those times, you cannot trace God. But you need to learn to trust Him anyway. You need to learn to trust Him anyway. Remember, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. The life of faith is, only, is the only way to please God. The life of faith really requires a life of surrender. True faith requires surrender. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, But without faith... It is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Can't please God without faith, friends. Next command is that we need to do good. Do good. Trust in God and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. To walk in the way of peace, we need to learn to trust God and to do good. To do good is a command to holy living. Not a command to salvation, to earn your salvation, but to holy living. Be ye holy as I am holy, saith the Lord. God expects His people to live a life that is honoring to His name. If God's people could ever learn that, that God is pleased when we live for Him, we would see Him bless us in ways beyond what what we could comprehend and even imagine. Indeed, the formula for sex, success rather in Christian life, in the Christian life, is found in Matthew 6 and verse 33, where Jesus says this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So these food shortages that they're talking about, and famine and, uh, that appear to be coming, don't worry. God will feed you if you diligently seek Him and put Him first in your life. He is in control. I can't emphasize that enough. Now, I'm not saying that you don't prepare. There is wisdom in preparing. And there is wisdom in preparing for that rainy day. Just look at Joseph in the, in the Old Testament as an example. He prepared in advance for the seven years of famine during the seven years of plenty. And that was to his advantage. And the people of Egypt... And of course, his brethren that came. So you know, you know, speaking of coming food shortages, on a side note here, apparently the, large, the world's largest cricket uh, food processing plant is located just two hours away in London. And I've read now Toronto Star headlines, 
and other mainstream media outlets preparing us to eat bugs, to, be bu to eat bugs. Well, you know what? John the Baptist lived on locusts and honey, so you know what? If we've got to live on bugs as gross as it sounds, so be it. I, gotta, I wonder what they're producing. Is it going to be like some like soy burger, except to be cricket burgers? I don't know. <laughs> some kind of processed, you know, filled with preservatives and all kinds of garbage. It's kind of like soil and green. That, that green, whatever, they would eat it, but they never knew what was in it until they found out later. Which causes me to think, is that same mentality? We're going to be eating the, uh, what was that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. I don't put it past them anymore. The level of wickedness that's in this world. But if we're brought to a place where our only source of protein is processed cricket meat, if you can call it that, then so be it. Praise God. After all, verse 25 tells us, or t uh, tell, t tells us that David is an old man. Or f after all, verse 12 uh, tells us, when uh, this is David here, is an old man. He says this, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You know, David at this point has seen it all in his life, and he has never seen in his life the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. That's us. That's us. Just keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't worry about your next meal. And there's many missionary stories. We know about Darlene Dibler Rose. I mean, that should be an encouragement to you. You know, God can bring you to that brink where you're wondering what that next meal is. Think of George Mueller as well. He prayed for the food that, we, that they didn't have. He gave thanks at the table. And it showed up. That's the faith that we need to have as Christians. See, we've had it way too easy. We've had things way too convenient at our fingertips. In, the, in a way, God, uh, God, you know, if God takes it away from us, and He could, it may not be the bad thing. It may not be a bad thing. It may refine us and purify us. We look at the comfort. We have the command given to trust God and do good. Now we have the result, and that is the comfort provided. When we do God's will, he will take care of us. And how will David know about this? Well, he was an old man who had seen the Lord allow him to sit on his enemy's throne. And he knew that serving God always pays off. So the whole point here is this. If you walk with complete faith in God, and if you will live your life with the intent of pleasing him, he will in turn commit himself to taking care of you. Indeed. He'll take care of you otherwise, regardless, because he is God. Praise God for it. But we ought to commit our ways and our will to him. The way of peace in our life means that we will have to learn to control our walk. And it requires the conditioning of our will away from ourselves and toward God. Often we do things based on our own will, our desires. So we need to condition our will. Verse 4. It says this, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight thyself in the Lord is a command. It means to take exquisite delight. When life goes bad, we tend to focus on the problems that arise around us. We're drawn into ourselves. When this happens, we become defeated and depressed, depressed and fall into despair. How often at all times of life, we are challenged to let the Lord be the focus of our attention, despite what pit we may find ourselves in. If we can focus on who He is to us and what He has done for us, for the Bible says this, For blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That is Ephesians 1 and verse 3, if you're taking notes. If we can focus on who He is to us, what He has done for us, where He has taken us, and how much He loves us, then the darkest day can be endured because we know something better awaits us down the road. When we are lost in Him, then our, then our will and our desires will be lost in Him as well. When this happens, He will lift us up or lift us out of our despair and fill us with His glory. I firmly believe that we as Christians can lay claim to this promise given, give, that is given us in the latter part of verse 4. 
When we choose to obey the command and delighting ourselves in the Lord, we can lay claim on this. In doing so, He will give us the desires of our heart. Now, of course, when we are walking in the way of the Lord, our, then our desires will naturally be in accordance to His will, to His way. The way of peace in our lives means that we will have to learn to control our walk. It means it requires the conditioning of our will away from ourselves and toward God, and it means the committing of our way unto Him. Now, the committing of our way unto Him. Verses 5 and 6 says this, or the, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. And He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Commit thy way unto the Lord is a command. It means to roll onto. The idea here is that we are to roll, uh, roll the burdens of our life over unto the Lord. The Lord has not asked His children to carry these burdens of life alone. He tells us to bring them to Him. Psalm 55 and verse 12, it says this, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Cast your burden upon Him. That is a command. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Again, a command. Come, come. It's a divine invitation. But he said, come unto me. He will give you that rest. He will give you that peace. Another command. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall promise Find rest unto your souls. Worry is not going to give you rest. Fretting over what's happening in this world will not give you rest. Only Jesus will give you that rest. For he says in verse 30, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. First Peter 5, 7. First Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth, on, for, he careth for you. Casting all your worries all your burdens upon him. He, why? Because he cares for us, for he careth for you. We do not have to bear the heavy burdens of life all by ourselves, on our own. We have a God who cares for us and commands us to bring our burdens to him. So may we all take heed. And I do believe that there are heavy burdens here in this room this morning. I may not be able to relate, but God does. By the way, we ought to bear each other's burdens. The Bible commands it. Stop being so selfish and bear your fellow brother's burdens, especially in this church. Especially in this church. The whole emphasis here is that when we are walking in faith and placing our burdens on the Lord, He will take care of us. We may not like the way we are called upon to trod, but in the end, the faith of the child of God, the saint, will be vindicated. Brethren, God is never hurried by our worry. No. He does not get excited when we struggle with the situation that we find ourselves in. Often He uses it, uses that situation or that circumstance to purify you, to refine you, to draw you close to Him. Why? Because you may be taking Him for granted otherwise. Otherwise. What He is looking for is faith. He's looking for obedience and a willingness to yield in the midst of the struggles of life. Have you yielded through your struggles? Have you totally given it all to God? Relied on Him? His promise to us is that our faith will never be in vain. Our, we don't, our faith is not in vain. We have a living faith. We have a living Savior. May we recognize that. May we reverence that fact. May we glory in that fact. The world doesn't have it. The world's religion does, religions don't have this. The Roman Catholic down the street here, Our Lady Peace here, that church, every morning, those people don't have that hope. But we have that hope. So the way of peace in our lives means that we will have to learn to control our walk. It requires the conditioning of our way or away from or our will rather from ourselves and toward God it means the committing of our way unto him and it requires the consecrating of our weight the consecrating of our weight verse 7 
where it says, another command, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in the way. Why? Because, the, because of the man who bringeth, rather, be, prospereth in the way because of the man, rather, who bringeth wicked devices to pass. I'm going to repeat that. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in the way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Don't worry about what Bill Gates is doing and any others. I've been guilty of that, I'll be honest. Because you know what? His day of reckoning is coming. Trust in Trudeau, who seems to be above the law, his day of reckoning is coming. He's going to fall hard and fast unless he repents. So here we are commanded to rest. We are told to rest in the Lord and wait for him. The word rest means to be silent, be still. Then we are once again told not to fret. We are commanded not again to fret. We are not to be so consumed with the burning anger, with a burning anger, and ought not to, to, to absolutely uh, override us and drive us and consume us. Again, righteous indignation is okay, but such indignation must be tempered, and it ought not to rule us. To fret carries with it the idea of getting ourselves worked up into a rage over the condition of the world and over the valleys we have to walk through. No. Our duty during the difficult days of life is to be patient, to rest and be silent while the Lord works out His purposes in our lives. Now again, this is not easy, but this, is the kind of this kind of attitude was modeled for us by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. He's an example to us. When He was abused, when he was mocked, crucified, had his beard plucked out all on the cross of Calvary. He was, they reviled against him, yet he reviled not. There was no guile in his mouth. He endured the inflictions, but he yielded in silence. For in Isaiah 53 and verse 7, we learn that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb, as a, as a lamb to, the, to the slaughter and as a sheep before his, her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. There is a time to be silent, by the way. There is a time to say nothing. Therefore, regardless of that burden that you are carrying or that you are called to bear, learn not to whine, learn not to murmur and complain, but bear it for the glory of God or to the glory of God and wait patiently on him to work out his will in your life. Now, this isn't easy but it is an attitude that God will bless and can bless and will use for His glory. Now lastly, I want to look at the, the way of peace in our walk, the way of peace in our law, walk, the way of peace in our walk. And this requires the conquering of our wrath, right? What's fretting? What's fretting here? It's really wrath. It's really human wrath. We need to conquer that, verse 8. And there's a command here given, cease from anger and forsake wrath. You got cease and forsake. You need to cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Here we are commanded to refrain from anger. It is easy to allow ourselves to get to the point of bitterness toward God, to get all worked up, uh, to, uh, toward bit uh, bitterness toward God, the church, the government, et al. When the problems of life mount up against us, it's easy to get to that point. Christians are not immune to it. Christians may find themselves where God seems so distant that they end up becoming bitter toward Him. But this is not what God wants, indeed. When we see the wicked live their lives of ease while we walk through the deep, dark valley, there is a tendency to become angry with God for some. There is a tendency to question Him and doubt Him. However, we must be careful that we do not abandon righteousness for evil in the day of our affliction. God's will for us is that we stay the course because there will be an end to our struggles down the road. But for the moment, we are to abide in His will and walk in His way faithfully. Now, we may or may not suffer as Paul did for the glory of God. We may or may not. Yet when he reached the end of his life, he was able to say this, that he had fought a good fight and that he had finished the course and that he had kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4.7 Not many finished their course. Many have fallen away from the faith. We're living in a day where those that have started strong are ending weak. They're not going out with a high hand. 
I personally want to be able to say the same thing. Do you? If so, learn never to be angry with the Lord if that happens to be a problem for you. If it happens, for some it is. Learn that righteousness does, does indeed pay off in the end. Never give up. Rather, give in to Him and His will, and He will see you rather through it. He will see you through whatever you're going through. He will. God is there. He's there through your trials and tribulations. And if you are called to persecution, to be persecuted, He will be there. I often remind our children of this. Say, you know what, there could be a time where God could take your mommy and daddy away, but you know what, you still have Jesus. You still have Jesus. He will never leave thee or, or forsake thee. He is there. He is real. And He will carry you through. Now, despite the fact that all of these commands, which will ultimately lead to the way of peace in our, in our walk of life, being somewhat of a challenge to follow, they will enable us to reap good fruit when they, obe when they are obeyed. They will enable us to reap good fruit when they are obeyed or when obeyed. These commands are essentially a call to action. To trust, delight, commit, rest, and cease. God is calling us to take control of our lives as we yield to Him. He is calling us to be involved in the process. You see, I may not be able to have control of the circumstances in my life, but I can control how I respond to those circumstances. I can control my mindset and my reaction to that. I can, control with the, I can control by the grace of God my response to the trials and tribulations that may befall me, indeed. So my challenge to you this morning is for you to diligently seek the Lord's way through the valet, through, uh, through, sorry, uh, seek the Lord's way and by, by taking these five steps I've given you and uh, given you here and, uh, sorry, I've lost my, I have a little bit of typo here, but my challenge for you here is for you to digitally seek the Lord's way through these steps I have given you, and you will find God's peace in your walk of life. Heavenly Father, I give thee thanks, Lord, for the blessing of this message. Lord, I may stumble through it at times, but Lord, the message does not return void. Thy word does not return void. And I pray, Father, it was a blessing to thy people here today. Bless the food, the time of fellowship, Lord. We continue to pray for Mrs. Foreman, Lord. Lord, just give her grace, Lord. It's difficult for her. Thou knowest what she is going through, Lord. We do pray for healing, pray for wisdom for Trish and Jen, Lord, as, as they take care of their mother and help us to bear that burden as a church, Lord. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Amen.